If I were to bring a mountain bike to Formula One racing um, as a contestant, that would be a good joke. Everybody would be uh, laughing, they would be in on the joke, and it's for obvious reasons. Uh, you know, a mountain bicycle can never hope to compete against, you know, something like Formula One race car, in the Formula One race car's environment anyway. Now, trade that up. Let's say I bring a mountain bike to the mountain. What? Now it doesn't seem like such a joke. In fact, a Formula One race car, for all of its expense and glamour, would seem a little out of place, wouldn't it? A mountain bike can be used for its own experience of adventure and entertainment. It can haul, you know, logistics into tight places that, uh, you know, other vehicles can't get into. It can be used for life-saving or sustainment. It can have many different uses. Um, so it's not to say in this analogy that mountain bikes are bad because everybody can afford them and they're they don't have speed and formula race cars which no one can afford but has all this power they're good that's a weird kind of metric and yet this is often what we say about the militia take a look at this picture what do you see i see a 60 year old man um i see one two three 13, 14 year old boys. On the lower right hand corner, I see a young woman. And they're doing something admirable here. These are Ukraine citizens uh, in Ukraine taking up arms to become self defense or community defense militia. This is problematic for several different reasons. It is a little too little, a little too late. And it smacks of desperation. When we use militia, like the mountain bike analogy, when we use them in the wrong environment for the wrong thing, it ends in disaster. It becomes a very sinister, dark joke. That desperation looks a lot like this desperation. This is Japan in World War II, training a bunch of schoolgirls how to defend their communities with bamboo spear. Here, they're taking young boys and putting them into airplanes to crash themselves uh, into American warships. And of course, both of these end very, very badly. This is the reality that Tokyo and Japan put up with, fire bombings. And this is what they should have been, if anything, uh, being taught rather than spear defense, because this is the reality. That's what happens to a militia that is poorly trained, poorly equipped, and stood up too late, then thrust into an arena for which it was never designed in the first place. Is it just Japan? Oh no, 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 no. We can look at other examples throughout time, but let's stay for sake of argument with World War II. Here we see the German Hitler Youth. And so the Hitler Youth went off to war. And how'd they fare? Well, not so well. Just as you might predict, they lost in mass numbers. As heartbreaking as this is, Germany lost its youth in desperation. But how about the Volkssturm, the people's self-defense militia of Berlin and other cities? How'd that turn out? Well, it looks good on paper. They were given advanced weaponry and taught to use it. So these aren't spears. Surely the Volkssturm will have a better turnout than bamboo spears, correct? Not so much. They were also too little, too late, poorly trained, poorly led, and then thrust into an environment for which they were not prepared. This isn't to say that Ukraine doesn't have multi-tiered um, martial defense. They have their first tier regular army and air force, and they're very big and very well trained and very well equipped, taken on an even keel. Uh, they have their reservists who are called up and regularly rotate into um, the combat theater and are also on standby. And lastly, they do have um, irregular forces, that is popular militia forces, who work alongside of the reservists and who work alongside of the regular army. And they have been in this fight since at least 2014, if not even before then. It takes a while to 
stand up a warrior. Depending on what level you want to get them to and who you talk to, it generally takes about six months to prepare a warrior to enter into a uh, combined arms unit and a force, a structured force, and then it takes about another six months, and this can be truncated, but you do so at your own peril. It takes about another six months to get that unit functioning as a unit. Squads and a platoon, and then you train up at the company level, then you train at the battalion level, and then you train at the regimental level. And to do that takes six months of very careful curriculum training. To throw people in at the last minute is an act of desperation and a disservice to everyone. Furthermore, we need to talk about what's the role? What is the role of a militia? Is the role of a militia to defeat uh, standing professional militaries? Whether that's domestic or an invading, doesn't matter. The question is the same. Is the role of the militia to go head to head with standing armies? And the answer is absolutely not. Now let's take a minute and step back. Because at this point, many of us, myself included, are compelled to say, oh, but what about this notable exception? And what about that notable exception? There are times where militia units have conducted direct action raids and ambushes. Um, there are times where militia units have entered into fortified defenses and repelled professional militaries, okay? I, I can start picking out these, um, these you know, incredibly heroic moments in history. But the exception to the rule proves the rule. And the rule is that militia, that is not the primary role, nor are they enormously successful at that. In most cases, when the militia is thrust into direct action against a professional military, they lose, and they lose badly. Frankly, if they can run away um, fade away in the face of the enemy in cowardice, it seems like. Yeah, but there's some cleverness to that, too, because they can live to fight another day. They're just not designed to do that. That's not the militia's purpose, for the most part. Again, with notable exceptions. But it's just not their, their role. What is their role? Well, frankly, it's enabling operations and sustaining operations. It is surveillance, reconnaissance, and intelligence. It's gathering and passing that. It's communication systems and operating those communication systems. It's logistics and transportation systems. Getting the beans, batteries, bullets, and band-aids to the troops and moving troops all around the battle space when necessary. Think of the little ships of um, you know, uh, Dunkirk. Perhaps we give too much credit to the little ships in the sense that they didn't move as much as the big ships did. That's not the point. The point is that they were there, and they were frustrating, you know, the Germans' efforts to capture and cut off the British Army at, and the French Army at Dunkirk. And they do successfully, re, uh, you know, rescue this army. And there's, again, other examples of that. That's an excellent example of militia and their role. It's enabling. It's sustaining. It might be medical. It's these sort of things that the militia do in times of war, not to even mention that militia have a peacetime um, emergency service, emergency reaction role that the Standing Army doesn't, National Guard and other types of uh, military do, but this augments all of that. I do remember that when the Joplin F5 hurricane in Missouri, southern Missouri, just destroyed the downtown of that city, and, and there was a lot of devastation and death. And who was it that showed up first? Credit where credit's due. The FEMA volunteers showed up first. Unfortunately, FEMA didn't show up for two more days. And with that, within about six hours of the FEMA volunteers showing up, two or three deuce and a halfs with the Missouri militia pull up and they get off the deuce and a half with their own logistics, their own tents and waters, and their own tools. Like, they come out with chains to pull things down and chainsaws to rescue people and dig them out. And they set right to work, you know, 30 a uh, 30 man platoon just starts uh, working in Joplin, Missouri. And, and the FEMA volunteers came over and said, hey, can you help us to help them? And so it was the Missouri militia who saved the day for the first couple of days 
of the Joplin disaster, you know, the catastrophe. It was a natural catastrophe, but FEMA was caught flat-footed again and didn't respond well. And I'm sure there's going to be people who take an exception to that because it's just not a well-told piece of history. I'm going to suggest that this is actually pretty common. And maybe it's not even a slant against our federal agency that our local friends and neighbors, aka militia, are there first. They should be. There are the different roles of the militia, but in wartime, and we'll stick that uh, to that for the sake of this discussion today, what is their role? And their role is strategic and operational. Operational, as I just said, it is enabling and sustaining operations. Strategically, here's the value of a militia, is that it augments the efforts of the regular and reserve um, forces. If you look at the uh, American Revolution for the War for Independence as a model, you will see that there were plenty of U.S. militia. They augmented the, uh, the standing army, the Continental Army, and they were everywhere, literally in all 13 colonies. Why is that important? It's important because Britain had the greatest land army at the time in the world, and if they brought that to bear at any given point in mass, with all of its combat power to bear, I believe that they could have more readily and more quickly um, and more decisively won that war. But they were not able to do that. A big reason that they were not able to do that was that the militia was so active in every nook and cranny of all 13 colonies. So the British had no choice but to stretch out themselves to cover down greater territories and their lines of logistics and lines of effort were always threatened by the militia not the hardened forts the militia didn't storm the you know the barricades of hardened forts uh professional british soldiers they just didn't do that as a regular rule of thumb instead they conducted ambush they conducted espionage they conducted surveillance and passed information um, moved soldiers, hid soldiers, took care of soldiers, fed them. They did a wide array of, again, uh, support on an operational level, but strategically this bought time for the Continental Army and for the French Army and Navy. Um, and that's eventually who saves the day. That's eventually who wins the war. But the militia had their strategic role, their operational role, and once in a blue moon, they put a feather in their cap for a tactical success as well. Very rare, but it did happen. Ukraine has this uh, militia and, you know, irregular forces, and rightfully so, as it should. I'm not objecting to militia at all, nor am I saying they're failures. I'm saying you enter a mountain bicycle into a Formula One race, and it's going to end exactly how you think it's going to end. Use the right tool for the right job. Does the United States of America, does our federal government and our state governments, do we believe in militia? And that's a complicated topic, isn't it? It's very contentious. And um, it's easy to conclude, no, in spite of the fact that it's in, you know, um, our uh, U.S. Code of Law, and despite the fact that it's mentioned in our, you know, Constitution under the Second Amendment, despite all these things, they keep uh, infringing and encroaching upon the private American militia. And we'll get on to that in a little bit, but here's the thing, their actions say otherwise. Let's go back to World War II. The United States of America supported Filipino militias in World War II, as well as others, but that's an easy one, right? What were they called, the Kit Carson Scouts of the Philippines? And we supported them, we armed them, we trained them, we put advisors with them. We did the same with the French resistance, the Jed Bergs, dropped in and armed and structured and organized them and trained them. So Jedbergs in France and, you know, uh, in the Balkans and, uh, and I think maybe uh, Scandinavia as well. And of course, we armed militias in the Philippines in World War II. Ah, that doesn't count so much though, right? That was so long ago, different U.S. government at the time. Well, let's keep in mind that we armed Vietne Vietnamese militias from 1962 to 1972. Yeah, the popular forces call them, uh, militias go by so many different names here. They're volunteers, um, they're paramilitary, they're security forces, uh, they're popular forces, but nonetheless, they're militias. And sure, we supported them for that uh, 
for that decade. You know, we went right in at the end of the 1970s, 79 to 1992, and we supported, uh, that is the U.S. government, federal government, supported the Mu Mujahideen militias in Afghanistan, got out of there in 92, went right back in in 2001, didn't we? And from uh, 2001 to 2021, uh, the United States of America federal government supported uh, pro-Afghan militias with weapons and training and intel and everything you can think of. We did the same thing from 2003 to 2011 for Iraqi militias. And currently we're supporting militias in Syria, you know, the Syrian Democratic Forces. And we're supporting militias in, um, you know, uh, pro-Ukrainian militias in Ukraine today. So I'd have to say that at least when it comes to foreign private militias, the federal government has a long-standing history of recognizing the value of that, even if they want to abandon it here at home. Eh, for their own political reasons, right? For their own political expediency. They want to abandon what they support in other countries. I get that it's contentious. The reality is that there's some very dark chapters of the American militia, and if we don't recognize that, then we're being dishonest. We're not doing an honest inventory. However, speaking of inventory, let's look at the American militia. Uh, to my knowledge, the first one starts in the year 1636. Yeah, that's right, 1636, almost 400 years ago. America's first militia was the, um, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And of course, we weren't the United States of America, we were colonies at the time, but nonetheless, that's our ancestry, that's our history, and that's where it starts for us. And by the way, private militias were all the rage at different times in Europe, and Asia, and around the world. So our start in 1636. There's some very proud traditions that come of that. By 1754 through 63, Rogers Rangers stood up. Rogers Rangers um, in the uh, Seven Years' War, also known as the French and Indian War. This really started to identify American military traditions in many, many different ways because we didn't have a Continental Army, we didn't have a, continent, you know, a standing army yet. We had our militias. And Rogers Rangers were used for reconnaissance, skirmishing, guerrilla warfare, ranging ahead, therefore rangers, ahead of the British uh, elements. You know, French used them too, as a matter of fact, just as they used the Native American Indians. And so they would range ahead, conduct guerrilla warfare, conduct uh, intelligence. In major battles, they would be skirmishers. Those militias operated at squad and platoon level and lent greater credence to American NCOs, that's corporals and sergeants, you know, uh, lent greater credence and greater experience to them. So the American military has always relied uh, more heavily on our NCO Corps than most other nations in the world. That comes from our militia tradition. That's fantastic. It's interesting that, um, you know, we go right into the American Revolution and you see, again, you see rebel militia, you see Tory militia backing the British, and at one point in the war you actually see more Tory American militia backing the British than the rebel militia. So. Uh, who's to say what side the militia is on, right? And of course that holds true in the American Civil War as well. Both are actually civil wars, but we call one properly a civil war and the other one the revolution. Right after that war, 1786 to 87, we have Captain Daniel Shea's rebellion, and there's a lot to be said about that, but what's fascinating about Shea's rebellion is this. That is the calling mantra to a U.S. Constitution, meaning that when Shea started his rebellion, there was the Articles of Confederation, and everybody realized their weakness. We didn't have a standing military to respond to this, and we had to rely on other state militias going in to put down Shea's rebellion. The only problem was they wound up agreeing with Captain Shea, and they joined his rebellion, or walked off the battlefield completely saying, I'm not going to shoot at fellow Americans over this. Shea's rebellion should have been the death knell to every single U.S. militia, but lo and behold, the Second Amendment says, nope, this is right, this is legitimate, as does our U.S. Code today. So that's a real interesting sort of uh, dynamic there. And the after Shea's Rebellion, militias in America just explode. They're very, very popular. There's a real sense of honor and dignity in it and accountability as well as community, right? They built communities. And you see this come to a head 
in the War of 1812. Yes, it is true that the militia had a poor showing um, around Washington, D.C., and even up north in Canada. A very poor showing. Mm, to be fair, so did uh, most of the time, so did the Standing Army and Navy of America. But they, they had their moments, they had their shining moments. This is particularly true when they were embedded with regulars and or when they fought from fortified positions. They held their ground, and they did quite well. Where they really shine, of course, is in the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, there were regular forces there, but overwhelmingly, the Battle of New Orleans was fought by American militiamen. And, uh, and of course, we know how that turns out. It was a one-sided or lopsided victory in favor of the Americans against a very credible professional British army. And yet, somehow, it falls out of favor after that. It was like, oh, we did our thing, and the American militia all but disappears. It, there's just a few of them on the frontier, and then they go away until the American Civil War, when volunteer regiments fill the ranks of the first couple years of that war. That's a very common tradition, is to take a militia, particularly one that's been successful, and then transfer it over to professional service. And so I'm going to stop here before I go into a dark chapter. I do want to point something out. Speaking of taking militia units and traditions and embedding them and, you know, going ahead and activating them as part of the standing army or standing military. I like to ask people, when did the Rangers first stand up in the United States Army? And the answer is 1941. If you know the history of that, it was the British SAS uh, who stood them up, which is why today the British wear, or excuse me, the Rangers wear the tan beret. It's hearkening back to the British SAS. It's 1941, but wait a minute. But there were U U.S. Rangers Ranger militia since 1954. We're talking almost 200 years of history and some outstanding history. Uh, Ranger units often were the elite and were able to pull off some of those, you know, tactical successes, feathers in their caps, some real uh, bravery and bravado there. And, and yet they don't come into the United States Army after 200 years of existence. They don't show up into the United States Army until the 1940s, and today we sing their praises. Once again, it shows you the traditions and the pride of the American militia. We get into the Dark Ages, and, and during the Civil War you really did, and particularly in the South, but even the North had some ugly chapters, and that is that the uh, militias devolved into really brutal guerrilla warfare that eventually turned against the civilians and went to crime. In some cases, just flat out went to crime, criminal acts, violent criminal acts. And so there was a real backlash against militias in the wake of um, the American Civil War, and perhaps rightfully so. But it, uh, it grows again in popularity by the close of the century, and you see um, the militias called up and rise to the occasion in the 19, or 1898 Spanish-American uh, War, where you see U.S. volunteers go all over the world, you know, to the Philippines and, and notably to Cuba, and you see the U.S. volunteers, they started to be calling U.S. volunteers um, the Rough Riders under Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and they have wonderful success on offensive actions at San Juan Hill. So Teddy Roosevelt was in the militia. A lot of presidents were in the militia before and even after Teddy Roosevelt. Abraham Lincoln served in the militia. In 1903, there is the Militia Act, by the way, and we, we are, I'm not doing justice unless I mention that. It was the effort to create the militia into an organized militia that we now know as the National Guard, and I believe this also includes the State Guard, which is different than the National Guard. But those are public militias. However, U.S. Code still recognizes the unorganized militia, what I'll often refer to as the private militia. Um, but it is the unorganized militia by U.S. Code, just so we're clear, and it involves all able-bodied males ages 17 to 45. That still holds true to this very day. And we see the end of the militia, right? Do we? A dozen years later or so, World War I breaks out, and America's not involved. But we are, because the Lafayette Escadrille are U.S. volunteer pilots flying in formations in France. And the U.S. Volunteer Ambulance Service is also working from 1914 through 18, and even before uh, the Lafayette Esquadrille, 
Um, they're operating in France and Italy throughout the war, and those are U.S. volunteers going over in formations, in militia formations, doing supportive work, shaping operations. And certainly the sky, while it can be decisive, at the time was seen as shaping operations. So these are very appropriate roles for the U.S. militia, and they're there years before the United States Army shows up. By the way, Ernest Hemingway served in the U.S. Am Ambulance Corps. And by the time we get to World War II, oh my gosh, there's American militia everywhere. They were helping defend Wake Island. Um, they were the first American volunteer group, the AVG Flying Tigers in China. Um, there were naval militia off the coast, east coast and um, in the Caribbean of the United States, uh, volunteer subspotters where yachts went out and, uh, and actually hunted subs and passed information on to the Navy and to the, uh, you know, to the Air Forces to destroy subs. Once again, in the thick of it, with his yacht and a submachine gun, uh, was Ernest Hemingway. What a guy. But there you go. Uh, that's, that happened too. And if you say it ended in World War II, you'd be absolutely wrong. Air America was a CIA, a CIA operation where essentially volunteer, you know, militia groups uh, were pilots doing supporting operations in Southeast Asia from 1946 to 76. And yours truly served with MPRI as a uniformed armed uh, volunteer, U.S. volunteer, and some were wearing USV on their uniforms in Iraq working with Iraqi infantry battalion. So it goes on and on and on. The long story short is this. The American militia have been around for 400 years. We've served in just about every conflict you can think of. When I say we, you are unofficially part of the American militia, unorganized militia, if you're between the ages of 17 and 45 and able-bodied. Nonetheless, whether you're unorganized, whether you're practicing, whether it doesn't matter. The point is that the American militia has been around for just about 400 years now. And our value is not coming together and uh, trying to duplicate or replicate a standing military or even the reserve forces of that military, but rather our strategic value is that we augment that military in terms of operational assets and yes, from time to time, in a little bit of tactical operation bravado. All right, thank you.